good evening, Kevin. Um, thank you very much for accepting our invitation and, uh, and uh, agreeing to participate in this uh, series of webinars organized by the Russian Arbitration Association, Arbitration Kitchen. This is uh, series three, season one. And today we would like to have an interview with you uh, as uh, as a representative of SIAG, Deputy Register and uh, Central Director. Kevin, um, what are you going to cook with us today? Thank you very much for having me, Alexandra. Uh, I actually feel a little bit underdressed right now because I see <laughs> that, uh, such an amazing <laughs> outfit on. Although I'm somewhat limited by the, the temperature in Singapore, it's around 30 degrees today, but can you, I know this is a bit, uh, irregular, but can you tell me about your outfit to start? Yes, thanks very much. It's a very good point for the stars. I think while many people are wondering why, why I'm looking like this and uh, whether I'm wearing this outfit every single day of this remote working. Uh, I have to I, I, I have to admit that the, I'm affected by, um, I'm influenced by my boss, Vladimir Khalei, who is who was wearing Belarusian shirts uh, the, during the previous series, so tribute to Vladimir. Um, so, um, uh, and the second point is that uh, it was the idea of the Russian Arbitration Association to have an event during the Paris Arbitration Week. It was, I think, the first time when we thought about it was two years ago, uh, and we prepared the costumes and so on, but the idea didn't go through. That's why I have the Ukrainian costume. That's why I decided to follow the idea of, the ma of, of my management and uh, to include some interesting details in this interview. Yes, absolutely. So, okay. And, and I think that this, this whole series is, is a great idea, uh, especially when we're all working from home and the ability to reach out uh, to users from other jurisdictions, especially over uh, a meal while talking at uh, arbitration, I think is a great idea. One of the interesting things, because what I'm doing is I'm doing barbecue short ribs tonight, and there's really a tradition of barbecue. So my entire life, because I'm the youngest in my family, uh, it's always the most senior person that does the barbecuing. So it's my older brother, it's my dad. So I'm always second chair, third chair. Uh, but really one of the traditions of barbecues is that you put the meat uh, on the grill uh, and then you talk. So that's, it's kind of perfect uh, for tonight. Uh, as went out in the instructions as well, because uh, some people will be cooking in their, in their houses. So this works equally well, a nice cast iron pan. Uh, if you've marinated the ribs, there's also vegetarian options so there's a variety of different ways of doing it kind of the idea behind the dish this dish was passed to me uh by my brother who's a, a lawyer in canada where i'm originally from the idea is it sort of is a fusion of uh east meets west you'll see that there's asian flavors in there there's some western cooking traditions i'm by no means an expert but i like the marinade enough where i can just actually take spoonfuls of the marinade so uh, assuming I'm able to cook this right, uh, it should be uh, quite good. So, sounds amazing for the beginnings. We have a master chef of grilling. We, we have um, uh, barbecue ribs that the uh, master chef is going uh, to cook today. So Kevin, just a brief, um, a brief view at the list of ingredients. Um, uh, sure. I'm, I'm going to remind the guests of the event that uh, uh, we hope that uh, you have time to marinate the ribs or maybe you will uh, watch this, this video and uh, nail this skill, uh, this skill to prepare the ribs. Kevin, would you like uh, to uh, give us a small uh, instruction as to how it's better to prepare the ribs according to the list of your ingredients? So the idea, I think one of the things during COVID-19 is sometimes you're not going to have all of the ingredients. So it may be that you don't have fish sauce, you don't have ginger, but I think that the, the idea and the combinations of the marinade still work. So I think if you're, if you're missing an agreement, ingredient, don't worry about it. Uh, the idea is just to get some of those, those sugars, the sweet and the sour on the meat. Uh, we said uh, six hours, it's usually four to six hours for the marinade, but if, if, if it's shorter, uh, 
that also works. And the idea is just to get those flavors into the meat and then we put it on the grill. We'll get some caramelization thereafter. There's also a glaze that we're gonna bake into the grill. Uh, but if the two ingredients are missing, I think no problem good, at all. Good, good news, because uh, right now in the terms of lock, lockdown, it's very hard to get some, you know, exquisite ingredients. Like, uh, for example, in Russia, fish sauce is a kind of a rare thing. And sometimes people ask me, like, what is this? What is this supposed to be? Yeah. Uh, so, so that's great about the marinade. That's a good, a, a good tip that uh, the ribs should be marinated uh, in, uh, in its, uh, uh, within the period of four, from four to six hours. Yep. And then goes uh, next the glaze. So when the, the glaze should be cooked? So the, so the glaze will go on as, as the very last part. And it depends a little bit on the thickness of the ribs. There's going to be some variation whether you're cooking in a cast iron uh, frying pan on the top of the stove, you might be baking, you might be on a barbecue. So the thickness of the ribs is going to depend a little bit whether it's bone in or, or bone out. So I have thin short ribs, uh, so they're gonna be about five to seven minutes aside. After we do both sides, after we get that caramelization, hopefully some nice grill marks on it, on it as well. Uh, then we're gonna put, we're gonna brush on the glaze uh, and then that's going to kind of lock in the glaze about one or two minutes uh, aside. Uh, but I think what you want to do is you want to be very aware of the doneness of your ribs, whether it's beef or a vegetarian substitute. Uh, you can use a toothpick uh, to push it into the ribs to see uh, resistance. You can bend them. Uh, they should uh, almost break. Uh, and if you have bone in ribs, uh, the meat will almost get close to falling off, off the ribs. So just make sure that uh, the ribs are fully done, which is a delicate balance with barbecue because if you overcook, then it's going to be too tough. Uh, but I think the starting point is to make sure that they're fully done. Kevin, and one of the most in, uh, one of the most important questions that uh, Russian people would ask you, I, I, I would say, <laughs> I would say because I know the, this pain. If a person is locked down in his apartments and he only has the oven, for example, does it yeah. work for preparing the ribs, or you should in any case have the grilling machine? It can work. So, so I would recommend I would recommend a frying pan. Uh, lots of times, uh, being Canadian, and of course we, we have a similar climate to Russia, lots of times it's much easier. So if I was in Canada right now, and if I was making this, I would probably just do it on a stove top uh, in, a, in a frying pan. Uh, you can also bake it. You can, you can slow cook the ribs. You can, you can do it in a slow cooker as well. But I think sort of so that everyone's on the same page uh, with hopefully most people having stove tops, I think frying pan or grill for people that have it is probably the best and the quickest quickest way to, to do the ribs. Okay, okay, noted. So moving next, um, uh, the plates, so the side dishes for the ribs. Uh, any plans to cook them today or it's just a recommendation for the guests to prepare them for the uh, lunch time or dinner time? Uh, well, I, 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 hope that the, I hope the plan is to cook them today. I can see some I can see some smoke coming from uh, uh, the barbecue in the in the background. I mean, I think especially during coronavirus, we're, we're all adapting. And one of the good things about this dish, in addition to maybe not needing all the ingredients, is there's a lot of different ways to plate it. So in the instructions, we had the idea just be heaped on rice. You can serve it alongside vegetables. Or the way that I like to do it, even though it's not incredibly dignified, is to wrap it in a lettuce leaf. So lettuce leaf, rice, some chili sauce. You cut the ribs uh, uh, in about one centimeter slices on the diagonal, and then you wrap it and you effectively eat it like a wrap. So that was how it was prepared for me. That's how I grew to like it. But you can, you can do it in a lot of different ways. And the last point on this agenda is the wine choice. So I personally should admire the wine choice. I think this is great. So uh, what are you drinking? Pinot Noir or something else? Uh, so I'm going to claim that I'm drinking water. Uh, <laughs> because but... you need to work maybe after, <laughs> after dinner. <laughs> well, I think that I, I, I'm, I'm claiming it for the benefit of, of all of our Russian friends. So because it's after, it's after six. 
uh, in Singapore. So I hope everyone watching it is having a drink. Yeah, a Pinot Noir uh, would be good with them. It also works with a with a white, maybe a, a Belgian uh, fruity beer uh, or any beer. Certainly always works for barbecue. So I think that the dish pairs quite easily as well. Okay, okay, that's great. So, um, Kevin, um, how is actually life is in, in Singapore? How is your lockdown? Are you working from home now? Yeah, so, so we're, we're fully remote now. There was a circuit breaker in, in Singapore. So the, uh, all of SIC, the SIC secretary, we're all, we're all working from, from home. I think one of the advantages is that SIC has is a lot of our work is, is online to begin with. All of us lawyers are pretty transferable. Sometimes you do like to have the hard copies of the documents, but we have an online case management system. We're able to work uh, quite quickly and uh, adeptly online. So it's not too, it's not too much uh, of a change for us. So we're encouraging all parties to try to file things electronically, uh, but we're also able to take hard copies here and there as well. And uh, speaking about the filings, uh, how is it usually uh, done in the SIACA? Are the parties sending the tons of papers and boxes trying just to bomb you with uh, the uh, submissions, pleadings and exhibits? Or the parties from uh, particip participating in the SIAC arbitrations uh, mainly using electronic sources for filing? Yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of electronic sources. Every once in a while, you will get those wheelbarrows of A4 documents in eight separate uh, sets. Uh, but uh, SIC, we do get a lot of uh, ele electronic filing. Uh, it, it depends a little bit on the preferences of the tribunal as well. Uh, I think the tribunals and SIC arbitrations are pretty progressive, and we are sort of trying to move uh, towards more electronic document management. To me, that's actually one of the interesting things uh, about the COVID-19 pandemic, because obviously it's very difficult for the entire world. But I think that it might prompt certain uh, advancements in arbitration that we can carry forward once the world goes back to normal. If you look at things, say, for instance, uh, e-hearings, whether or not it's necessary if you have a three-member tribunal located in Sydney, Moscow, and Vancouver, whether it's necessary for that three-member tribunal, both sets of counsel, maybe multiple sets of counsel, all to fly to a hearing in Singapore, or can it, uh, can an e-hearing be used? So I think out of necessity, uh, SIC particularly, but all of the institutions are looking at ways of making things more efficient. So I think that you're going to see some of these lessons learned during the coronavirus are going to carry forward once, once the world is back to normal. So before we start cooking, um, I would like to devote some time to our uh, traditional, um, if I may say so, uh, biography and personal information about our speaker. Um, then I think we should go to cooking of the ribs. So Kevin, just, just, ju just to check some information with you, uh, starting from the official information that I managed to find to okay. find <laughs> so um, just let me do it as a full screen Kevin you are um, uh, just to confirm you are in the the SIAC starting from 2012 right That's right yeah so it is now um, even approximately eight years with the arbitration institution so I, I, I would suggest that the number of arbitrations that were uh, that were the administration of which uh, were supervised uh, by you is maybe uncountable already or you have any figure in your mind I mean many many thousand for sure and that's <laughs> part of the, the ev evolution of SIC I can remember when I joined in in 2012 because SIC was really this emerging institution and all of the uh, sort of documents and paper that we had, they all only went up to 200 cases. I think for us at that point, the idea of having more than 200 cases was uh, we hadn't even readied ourselves for more than 200 cases. And last year in 2019, nearly 500 cases, SIC, now one of the biggest institutions in the world in terms of international administered caseload. So I arrived at a very fortunate 
time where SIC was really starting to gain more and more traction. So it's, it's quite interesting to look at 2012 uh, for me to 2020 and the thousands of cases in between. And uh, be before joining the SEAC and starting uh, your new life with the arbitration institution, uh, you, you, are, you are from Canada, right? So you, you graduated and your, uh, as I would suggest, uh, the first place of uh, work was also in Canada. Yes. So, yeah, exactly. yeah. yeah. You're also admitted to the Canadian bar. Is it a kind of obligatory requirement for working in Canada or, uh, or you can just, I don't know, graduate with uh, JD and just, uh, and get LLM maybe, and then uh, proceed with uh, working in the law firm or the law firms actually are asking for getting this uh, admission to the bar. Yeah, so I mean, you could you could just do your Juris Doctor, you wouldn't necessarily have to do the bar, maybe you want, want to go in house. One of the interesting things in, in Canada is that so I did an LLM in Stockholm, uh, at the ICAL program, uh, w which is really one of the greatest arbitration programs in the world in terms of really getting to know arbitration, but I had to go chase the arbitration dream. Canada's uh, a pretty good jurisdiction for arbitration, but I had to leave Canada, sort of part of the Canadian arbitration diaspora. So went to Stockholm, learned under Patricia Shaughnessy, the ICAL program. She's Got great, the, actually. I think she's yeah. the heart of this program. And many, many yeah. people are, were just kids of Patricia and saying, like, Patricia, no, no. we love you. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, You're a good mother. <laughs> totally. And I mean, the, the alumni there is so strong because really anywhere in the world that I go, whether it's China, South America, Russia, there is always uh, an ICAL alumni there. So a very close-knit group. Uh, but because in Canada, you don't have really that same kind of robust arbitration practice. You do in certain firms, but at least where I was working, it was more of a transactional firm. You're getting arbitration here and there, some mediation. But I knew that I had uh, to go international to really learn about the arbitration practice. So started in Stockholm, um, got more grounding there, and then went to Singapore and SIC. So that's almost, it's starting to touch on a decade but uh, it feels like the time has went very fast because there's always things happening in Singapore, things very move, move very quickly. What I often say is that you're not really looking at what you're going to do a week from now or a year from now because you're just trying to figure out how to get through today. That's the, the pace of institutions now and the level of rigor and nuance that happens is you're just trying to deal with the next thing. Uh, you worry about next month, next year, uh, at, at the end of the day or whenever you can. Based on this, based on this, um, I, I, I would say very, 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 very touching introduction uh, from my, from my point of view. Uh, we were, we are going to move to the photographs that you kindly shared with me. So my word is with, is with you that I'm not going to distribute them, but um, there is an essential part of uh, our interviews uh, to, um, to assist um, ordinary people, our guests, the uh, events, just to get acquainted with the with the, with, with the life of uh, people who work in the arbitration institutions and just to introduce them as also ordinary people who have kitchens, are doing grill, jogging in the morning, and so on and so on. So starting from the first photograph. So, any, well, this... Any background? <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is pretty emblematic of promoting arbitration around the world. So for me, I end up traveling alone quite often. But the advantage is sometimes you get to go to very interesting places. So I did a, a series of events in, in South America, going from Bogota to Buenos Aires, Sao Paulo, Rio. Uh, and I managed to uh, carve out some time to go to Machu Picchu. What I remember very well about this, because Singapore is at sea level, uh, or maybe it could have been that I wasn't in the best shape, is that walking up those uh, mountains at Machu Picchu, I was really feeling the lack of oxygen because the elevation is quite high. So most times when I'm out speaking at events or promoting SIC, I'm generally 
frankly, traveling by myself, but I do find some time to, to look at some interesting distractions here and there. And this photograph was taken actually, or there, there is no certain location, just in the mountains in uh, South America? That's in, or in, in Machu Picchu. In, in, in Machu Peru. Picchu. Mm -hmm. yeah. This is amazing. So moving next. This is your hobby, as I would suggest, golfing. That's, yeah. that's, that's one of them. I think that in Singapore, the practicing lawyers, the institutional representatives, because things move very quickly, we don't always have time, but every once in a while, we can steal away for, for a day. Because I'm Canadian and I grew up with ice in my veins, always being cold, I find it amazing that you can golf in January. I think this picture was from around January, and the fact that you've got all sorts of beautiful golf courses here in Singapore. So that's, that's a day when... We, when we managed to get away for a bit. I agree. So photograph number three, hobby number two, I think. I... That, yeah, that goes, that goes from- uh, That goes that to goes Canada. From, from very warm, very warm to, to very cold. I, I, I mean, we've talked about this and I've talked about it with uh, Vladimir. There really is sort of this uh, identity between Canadians and Russians because uh, we have a lot of commonalities and one thing that happens in Canada is at least uh, with me is that you can skate as soon as you can walk so I can I can never remember walking when I couldn't skate so this was taken from uh, this over the holidays uh, last year and there's a lake uh, by where my family uh, has a cabin up in the mountains and all across this lake you have people that have cleared ice so you have you have probably 50 ad hoc ice hockey rinks all over the lake that people have shoveled. And then you have all of these games where everyone is playing on uh, Christmas Day, New Year's Day, all over this. Uh, so uh, when you look at it, it's a pretty impressive sight to see all of these rinks all over the lake. Photograph number four, hobby number three, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I like to be, I like to be around the water. I was, I saw, I saw Alexi Moore's presentation. I actually had a picture of me uh, scuba diving beside a bunch of sharks, but I noticed that, that Alexi, who's probably a much better scuba diver than me, uh, had some more impressive sharks. So I had to go do a stand-up paddleboard. Uh, but this, this is from uh, Hawaii. Uh, I try to get away there from time to time. So stand-up paddleboard, surfing, uh, anything that is not snow. Next one. That's, uh, oh, no, I have I have to I have to ask a question on behalf of all unmarried women women who asked me this question and asked me this question for you right now. Are you married, Kevin? I'm not. No, I. <laughs> Great news, <laughs> women. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I'm I'm single, and uh, that is uh, my niece and nephew. They both they both live in in Canada, uh, and. Yeah, a, a big a big part of my big part of my life. They're both great a athletes, super super sharp. Uh, that's one of the things actually I think about uh, COVID that can be frustrating. I think not just for me but for for everyone in the world is that we sort of miss these links with friends and family because we can't go sort of see uh, and visit them. So that's why doing things like this webinar is such a good idea. How often actually uh, are you, uh, uh, do, you visit, do you visit Canada right now or you're permanently in Singapore and some, on some yeah. business trips? Yeah, so, so it's, usually, it's usually, one, usually about once a year. I've tried to go uh, twice, twice a year, but most times, uh, you know, once or twice a year, whenever, whenever, whenever I can. So it seems, it's actually interesting because uh, it seems like over the last five years, I probably go to Russia more than I do to uh, Canada, but a bit closer. Maybe, may, maybe that's your destiny. I can say any <laughs> other thing. Could, could be. So ne next one. Uh, that's your Calixa, uh, I would suggest. Yes, this is the yeah. the the the, secre the secretariat. Yeah, this this is the uh, SIC secretariat. This this was an interesting uh, event because uh, so we all went to lunch and there was this competition that's put on by a few restaurants in Singapore, whereby if you eat a uh, a very, very spicy and hot bowl of ramen, you can get it for free. So they make the spiciest and the hottest possible ramen. So this was all of us engaging in this competition to see who could eat this fiery hot ramen. Sounds exciting. <laughs>
<laughs> so moving next um here we are you're you're actually a bit anxious here you're waiting for 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 your ramen <laughs> or this is just <laughs> I'm trying not to be noticed so that I don't have to eat the super spicy hot ramen. Okay, 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 okay. Uh, and that's the official photograph, yes. Yeah, that's that's the official photograph. So that's mm -hmm. uh, the SIC operation. We're about 45 strong in Singapore, but we also have overseas offices in uh, Mumbai, Gujarat, Seoul, and Shanghai. So we have these overseas, overseas offices, but that is... Uh, really the, the network node. That is all of your cases that you're filing and running. These are the people that are handling it. And I think it's going to be the last one and it's going to be the bomb of this uh, photo. At least, no, it's also, it's also your colleagues. And I think we've been waiting for this one. Wow. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> look, look, look at that. Uh, so a couple yeah, of I words mean... about this photograph. <laughs> we need, we need explanations. So that's, uh, I mean, and that's one of the amazing things of, uh, about arbitration. And sometimes I think when we're working the very long hours and when you're leaving work very late and you're frustrated, that all the opportunities and the interesting people that you get to meet. So that's me with Sarah Grimmer, the Secretary General of HKIC, uh, getting the opportunity to meet and have words uh, with your PM. Uh, very nice guy, very amazing opportunity. And that is some of the fun things that we get to do in arbitration. Agree. So Kevin, uh, people are hungry and they are asking <laughs> us uh, and they are asking us to start cooking. <laughs> sure. I was looking I was looking behind me. You can see that I'm very talkative because I was wondering if I could talk my way out of cooking. Uh, but I think <laughs> that we must cook. There's, there's no choice. I, I suspect that the, the, the barbecue has, has went out while we've been chatting. But let me see if I can try to move the camera over to a reasonable uh, angle. One second. All right. Very good. How does we that look? The, we, we see the grill. OK. All right, so it's still, uh, the, the barbecue is still going. So uh, hopefully you can, you can see this. So as per the instructions, we've got the ribs very nicely in the marinade. Uh, we probably want to take these out. You don't want to have them. Uh, I said in the instructions to pat dry uh, because you don't want to have them dripping in the interest of time. Let's just put them on the grill because it could be fun uh, because maybe we'll get some fire. So you can see, so you can see what we have. So short ribs, quite thin, uh, bursting with flavor from the marinade. We're gonna put, we're gonna put them on the grill. Maybe more fun. Uh, generally, I would have the lid open, but maybe it's more fun. Or uh, generally, I'd have the lid closed, but maybe more fun to have the lid open. What I've also done, uh, Alexandra, because I think, like every good arbitrator, before you go to the hearing, you already want to have all of the procedural history drafted. So, with that in mind, I have made sure to already prepare <laughs> uh, the rest of it. So, this is, I think, what we're going to play place it on. So it's a bed of lettuce. Uh, I have some cauliflower, cauliflower rice there as well. I also have some optional chicken rice, which is a very famous dish in Singapore. As I said in the instructions, vegetable to, ta to taste. So I have some chili peppers, some pomegranate seed, pine nuts, uh, cucumber as well. Uh, I'm actually, I'm quite proud. I'm quite proud of the pomegranate. Uh, oh yeah. Sorry. Are you still with me? Yes, we can hear you, but we can see you. Cannot see. Yes. Turn it on. Yes. Great. So I'm, I'm very happy about the pomegranate seeds uh, because I actually grew them on my rooftop. So those ones, I'm not even sure necessarily. But that's go fabulous. With you have pomegranates on your rooftop. This is yeah. just amazing. I don't know if those necessarily go with the dish, but I just, I had to, I had to have them. So like I said, these are, uh, these are meant to be around, uh, 
five to seven minutes per side. We want to get the caramelization, the grill marks, and then we're going to drop it into that lettuce bed uh, sliced diagonally. Karen, but just a quick, a quick, a quick question that, that came to us. Uh, from the participants so uh, we need to separate uh, you know that sometimes you can buy different ribs they are just as a whole uh, in whole or just already cut yeah. um, if you for example buy them in the, in the whole uh, would it be better to separate them before marinating or it's better to marinate the whole thing without splitting the ribs from each other I think it's really just personal preference some think that bone in ribs uh, because you get the flavors coming from from the bone uh, i think with the boneless it's going to cook a little bit quicker in any event or if you marinate them they may just end up falling off the bone i think that's what everyone is looking for with ribs is that you want ribs effectively that fall right off right off the bone so um just uh, to just to fix the steps that we're going as a procedural history um <laughs> we took the ribs uh, outside um, uh, from from the marinade and put them in the grill now we yeah. need to grill them right yeah so it is approximately five seven minutes yeah depend depending on thickness uh depending on bone in bone out also if there's vegetarian uh, mm -hmm. substitutes, but that's yeah, that's about the time we're looking. Just, at. Uh, just you should you, you should check your meat or some vegetarian stuff how 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 it's being prepared, and then we take them off and put the glaze and then again back to the grill. Or yes, yeah, I think yeah, mm -hmm. I think for I think for expediency, leave leave them on the grill. You can just jockey them if you have tongs or uh, if you're doing it in the frying pan, pan just. Uh, uh, put the glaze on and then just very quick just to lock lock in the glaze then we're going to take them off let them rest for a few minutes uh, and then diagonal cut uh, and then heaped onto rice or you can use uh, the lettuce wrap uh, cabbage wrap would also would likely work as well because we all want to be we all want to be versatile during these times okay okay that's clear from my side let me check the questions um Vladimir is asking, so we need to boil rice right now? So you don't even, yeah, so you don't need uh, rice necessarily. So mm -hmm. quite optional. So you can have it on rice uh, or you can just have it in a lettuce wrap as well. Okay. So, uh, and then chili sauce, vegetables, vegetables to taste, uh, whether it's cucumber. Uh, I have some chili peppers in there as well because I like, I like things a, a little bit, a little bit hotter. Uh, but pretty much at your option. Um, Vladimir is again very active in questions. How do how do you make the glaze? <laughs> uh, so the will you show us, Kevin? So how you're mixing the ingredients, or your glaze is already is ready? The glaze the glaze is is, is already already ready. But very easy, very easy to very easy to make. Uh, I can just. This is so the glaze, I, I, yes? I've got some, yeah, I've got some chili flakes in there, rice, wine, uh, water, and brown sugar. So uh, a, sim a simple glaze, again, looking for that caramelization effect, and that's just to lock, lock in some extra flavors. I think sort of the, uh, the, the marinade is the primary claim, and then perhaps a, a glaze is an alternative claim. Mm-hmm. And depending on the, depending, so right, uh, uh, Ekaterina Kobrin from Baker McKenzie is asking, uh, rice wine or vinegar in the glaze? Rice wine or vinegar in place? Vinegar in place uh, would work as well. Uh, it's a good thing, it's a good thing you cannot see what's happening on the barbecue behind me right now. Uh, but let's just say it's a robust, it's robust. <laughs> Juicing, Ugh. lots of, oh, that is, can that is looking good. Can you show us the process, how you're doing this? Uh, those, currently those are the deliberations of the tribunal. I'm gonna have to wait those, <laughs> those are fully. You're failing it or what? Or well, you're not yeah. showing it? <laughs> but it is, uh, yeah, to keep the suspense going, uh, we are, okay. we are getting. <laughs> We're okay, getting, yeah, okay. we're looking good.
but it is you do have to be a bit cognizant depending on thickness bone in bone out that these do uh cook quite quickly on, on high, high heat so these are almost going to be about about done so i will jockey them put them on the top rack sorry i'm, I'm trying i'm trying to do this with one hand There's also something about barbecuing too. I think that uh, at least, at least for me, kind of reminds you of growing up. That you're walking around the neighborhood and you the smell of the barbecue. That's why, that's why I'm also using a hickory chip smoker. It doesn't really go with the idea behind the, the dish, but it the, the smell, uh, or is, is very traditional for me because this is a bit more uh, of an Asian, of an Asian dish. So those are. Probably about ready. I think this is a very good skill to learn to be able to cook with one hand while holding a phone. <laughs> Master hand Chef. <laughs> Kevin, we also have a question uh, uh, from the participants. Uh, uh, what's a good vegetarian substitute for grilled ribs? Uh, yeah, so uh, tempeh, uh, sapin, uh, it's really, really too taste. I think that what you're looking for is you're looking for something that has the texture uh, of ribs and something also that's going to soak up the, the flavor of the marinade. So marinade. So that's a bit personal preference, but I think that's the idea. It's something that will soak up the marinade and get, give you that taste because that's really sort of the idea behind the dish. Okay. How's it going? Look, looking, uh, looking quite, quite good. All right, let me let me give you a, a bit of a view. Yeah, so these, I think, ones that have a pretty good, pretty good cook on. So what I'm going to do with these is is I'm going to put on put on the glaze. Okay. So you, can, so you can see you have that uh, caramelization there. So we'll shut, shut the lid, uh, let those sit for a couple of minutes. Do, do we know, uh, Alexandra, do we know how many people that we have cooking right now? Uh, I, I, I'm not sure about the number who is cooking, but we have um, uh, approximately uh, 40 uh, attendees now and uh, several people texted us that uh, the, uh, uh, the, 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 the dish is just amazing and they are going to cook it maybe during the weekend or, um, or this, uh, this dinner tonight. Oh, great. So in any case, um... so for expediency, uh, there we've got blades locked in the ribs, we are going to cut them. Uh, and then and then roll them there. I'm not I'm not sure if I can eat and talk at the same at the same time or if I if I can cut and talk but uh, like I said, that uh, it can be heaped over rice, served alongside vegetables to taste, or wrapped in uh, a lettuce roll. And even if uh, we agree that you can eat and talk, you can <laughs> eat while I'm asking questions, and then you're not going to it when you're going to answer my question. Okay. Maybe we're going to... Because it's a pity they are hot, tasty, and maybe you'd like to try them, and you you're going to sit like this before the screen of the laptop like mm, let's 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 finish this soon 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 <laughs> and so on that will be like uh I'll, I'll pro i probably won't be on email for an hour or so after this session because i will i will be eating eating all of, all of these ribs 
<laughs> okay, <laughs> okay. So the ribs look uh, look amazing, and actually, if you'd like to try them and just to continue the conversation, it, it it's okay for us. So it's it's lunch time for us. It's not going to be a problem. Uh, so um, we're 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 done with cooking and. Um, um, Katya, Katya, Katya said that um, um, have never seen this type of grill in our part of the world. She, she, from Baker in Moscow, uh, she's, she's our colleague. Um, in our part of the world, Weber is, I guess, is a monop is I guess Weber is a monopolist. Is it a common thing to have a grill on your balcony there? In Russia, it is like almost never happening. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's not not too common in Singapore. It's, it's, it's quite a common feature uh, in Canada. I know there's a, or a big barbecue tradition in Australia. Actually, our, our founder president, uh, Michael Priles, his daughter, Jess Priles, uh, is one of the foremost barbecue uh, experts in the world. So I had, uh, I at least gained some confidence because I, I talked with Professor Priles and he mentioned that he had discussed with his daughter and she said that she thought everything with my recipe looked okay. So I think that the, the fundamentals, at least they're sound. Okay. So um, I think we, uh, we've gone through all the questions. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, is this your original res uh, recipe, or would it be fair to call them grilled? Would it be fair to call them grilled calf ribs? Anonymous. <laughs> <idea>. <laughs> uh, I, I I have to confess, uh, uh, it it is it is my brother's recipe, which then I I have modified a little bit to my to my palate. But I spent most of my life eating other people's barbecue, uh, and now since the the circuit breaker in Singapore where we're all at home and because I happen to have a barbecue uh, I've sort of been learning and teaching myself trying new things and trying to give it a little bit of my own flair. <laughs> okay so um, if uh, now we have time for talking about this SIAC activities I have prepared some statistical information I hope you, you are not going to find it bo very boring so just let me know if you don't like it um, let me share the screen one second PowerPoint. so again this amazing photograph yeah, so, I think that one is that one's okay to see more than once. More than once, okay. The third time, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I'd like to start with the statistics uh, about the top ten foreign users participating in the SIAC arbitrations. Uh, we have summarized the statistics. Top ten, not all foreign users, of course. Uh, we have summarized the statistics for the last four years. So. Um, what um, uh, are there any specifics of uh, these parties working in arbitrations? Because I have noticed that that the top positions are with uh, India. India is a kind of uh, undoubtable, undoubtable uh, winner of this of the statistics. They have. Uh, uh, they have uh, the highest results. So even for two thousand. For 2019, the participation of Indian parties was uh, uh, 485. So it's a kind of uh, top one user. Uh, the second place uh, goes to uh, the second place goes to China, I think, because if we have a look at the years, um, China always has a second or third place. Do you see the statistics? Yeah, is, yeah. is it good on your on your phone? So, uh, yeah. so uh, sixteen, seventeen is second place, eighteen third place, and nineteen again third place. So, are there any uh, I don't know some lo lo local specifics of uh, of these parties? For example, parties from India always are always filing in paper, and they don't know electronic sources of filing or some. Some other interest, inter, interesting details of working with uh, uh, such a wide number of uh, foreign parties. Well, I mean, I think if you look at the 2019 figures, the amount of Indian parties is truly is truly stunning. That is 
uh, an enormous amount of Indian parties that are choosing SIC. And I really think that, that the SIC is the institution of preference for Indian parties. You'll even see uh, Indian parties on both sides to the extent that Indian parties can choose a foreign seat, still choosing SIC. The fact that the, the Philippines in 2019 was the second highest foreign user, that's the result of a lot of efforts uh, that we've done uh, through some uh, of our previous council, existing council. So uh, letting the Philippines know the kind of services that SIC offers. China, of course, is always going to be very popular with SIC. One of the interesting facets over the past, I would say, five years is how many American parties are choosing SIC. And if you think about it, if you're looking at the contracting stage, if you think about an American party, if you have a transaction between an American party and a Chinese party, for instance, if you're looking at that seat that is acceptable to both sides, more and more that seems to be Singapore and SIC. So it might be Singapore, it could be a different institution in Singapore, uh, but often SIC. Uh, I also think that the split between the common law tradition and the civil law tradition is, is quite compelling. Usually if we look at our top 10 foreign news is about half and half. Uh, certainly we've been going up to Russia a lot. I think that there are com some comparative advantage for Russian parties uh, to be choosing S Singapore. One of the interesting things uh, about being an institution is because ultimately you're not always hoping that things go to disputes. I think sometimes one of the best rewards you can have as an institution is to, to know that companies are using your clauses. You don't necessarily want things to go wrong. I think all of us want things to go right. And so it's not just the number of cases that you receive, it's the overall penetration that you have in the market of how many companies are using your clauses, whether or not they go to dispute. Taking to uh, just uh, coming back to coming back to the participation of Russian parties, while reviewing the same reports, I actually noticed that. Uh, just forgive me for saying this: um, uh, that uh, maximum five parties from Russia participate per year in the arbitrations. Uh, why? How can you explain this? Maybe how can we struggle with this? Uh, maybe you'll I don't know live partly in Russia and promote the SIAC services. <laughs> <laughs> or SIAC will open the representative office here? I think that uh, re really it takes some time because if you look at the average time from transaction to dispute, you're looking at three to four years. So SIC has been going to Russia for, uh, has really been focusing on, on Russia and having a dialogue with Russian users for in or around the last five years. So we're starting to see uh, more interest. Uh, it's a relatively small growth, but we know that lots of Russian parties are using SIC arbitration clauses. They recognize the advantages of Singapore overall uh, and that it really is a safe pair of hands for a dispute resolution clause. That's true, that's true. Um, and uh, about uh, about Indian and Filipinian, um, Filipinian parties who just uh, came on the top in 2019, maybe something mm. happened on the Indian market, don't you know? B because there is an, just an amazing boost in cases that uh, maybe happens uh, when there are some specific economic circumstances or, you know, political situation. Yeah, no doubt. I think, I think one thing you do when you're around an institution for a long enough time is that you want to draw overall trends whether you're looking at the over, overall number of cases, the number of cases from any jurisdiction, you want to look at trends rather than spikes or dips uh, because there are a lot of different variables that can go into why cases are a bit higher in a year or a bit lower. So you really want to be looking at the general trend. The general trend for Indian parties is that more and more Indian parties are indeed choosing SIC. The general trend for SIC is that SIC is getting more and more popular with users from all sorts of jurisdictions. But I think for any institution, if your numbers go up a bit or down a bit from the previous year, I don't think that's really a matter of concern because you want to look at the, the general trend on the things that you're doing. I agree. I agree totally with you. So also um, during the process of reviewing the website of the institution, I noticed that SIAC now has a series of webinars and you're also participating in them. So could you please tell us some more details about the 
general uh, line of these uh, events uh, organized by the SIAC, the speakers who participate in these webinars and uh, the auditory who participates in them? My, well, my, my understanding, we had, a, we had a webinar earlier today and I believe the maximum amount of part participants was a thousand and there were oh. more than a thousand registrations. So That's I was having great. lots of people emailing me saying that, uh, hey, I'm locked out. I need to be able to log in. And I told them, well, you must come and cook with, cook with me uh, and the Russian Arbitration Association. So hopefully uh, <laughs> any people that weren't able to, <laughs> to, log, to log into that event uh, have, have come here. No, I mean, I mean, it's, I think it's, we want to stay active. We want to stay connected to our users. Coronavirus does bring up a lot of interesting questions. There's some practical questions of how do we file? Uh, how are you guys transmitting awards? Do you still take physical copies? And there's also some interesting substantive questions. So something like early dismissal, if you have a question where a contract has not been performed because of the coronavirus and the non-performing party is not even denying the non-performance, very interesting case for early dis dismissal, where it's just a question if you're looking at the contours, say, of a force majeure clause. There's all sorts of interesting issues. It's new for everyone, but we have all these procedural tools, particularly at SIC, that could be very useful uh, during the time of COVID-19. So that's really our attempt with, uh, with these webinars, is to help inform, give an idea of the options available, and stay connected to our users. One thing that we're doing as well is that we're going to have a, a secretariat session where really it's just going to be answering questions from the users. Because the questions you get at an institution and you get dozens, uh, if not hundreds a week are very important because we're trying to tailor our services to the user. So something that may seem simple for an institutional representative may not have been communicated to a, use, a user in the same way. It's also different if you have self represented users or uh, legal, legal counsel. So what we want to do is provide an open forum where people can log into the webinar and ask any question that they want uh, about how to file cases with SIC or how cases are going to progress during the time of coronavirus. By the way, are there any employees still in the office of uh, the SIAC or, or all of them are working remotely? For example, one or two responsible people who are handling some office uh, office needs and some tasks uh, of emergency, for example. So, so we're all working remotely because there's now the circuit breaker in effect in Singapore. Before that, we had been on split teams where we effectively cut the secretariat in half, uh, and we had half the lawyers in on one week, and then the and then the other half. So, effectively. Uh, uh, everyone is working remotely now, but uh, our timelines still remain good. I think SIC and most of, most institutions have been refining their processes uh, to be able to function in a situation like this. No one could have imagined this situation, but I think all of the institutional processes have been building up to be able to manage a situation like this well. Mm -hmm. And um, going next, I uh, also would like to congratulate you with the amazing results for 2019. That's the highest result of uh, this year ever. So this is this is this is the schedule. Uh, this is the diagram with the uh, information about the uh, number, the total number of cases handled by the SIAC starting from two, uh, starting on two from 2000. So um, I think that uh, so compared to compared to the year when you joined the SIAC 2012, it was uh, 235, and it is almost twice increase in cases just in in eight years. I think this is the amazing result for the arbitration institution. Yeah, and I mean you you, you have to look at uh, numbers and what do the numbers mean? Uh, effectively, what numbers are telling you is that more people are choosing the institution, more people are confident in the in, in the institution. So, I mean, all of the institutions have the numbers. Like I was saying, I don't think we mind too much if they go up and down a little bit. What we like is that more and more users, and particularly more users from different jurisdictions, are choosing SIC rather than just looking at the raw numbers. Uh, and we'll assume that there's no connection to my arrival in 2012, right? 
Um, and besides, besides the number of uh, the SIAC administered cases is also very high. So compared to uh, 479 uh, total cases in, 2000, uh, in 2019, uh, the total number of administered cases is 452. So it is uh, only 25 uh, ad hoc arbitrations when, as I understand, the SIAC was uh, designated as uh, the administrative and uh, appoint appointing authority. Yeah, I think that, I mean, I think what users want is users want an apple for apple comparison. And if you're looking at it, international administrative cases, that's probably the most important figure. Uh, and you want to be able to look at all the different institutions, look at the different rules, look at the, the different caseloads. And I think that is the more most robust meaningful number is the amount of international administered cases. So yes, uh, the president of the Court of Arbitration of SIC has, is the default statutory appointing authority under, under Singapore law. We're happy to make ad hoc appointments, but if you want to show uh, the skill of an institution, it's administered cases and particularly uh, international administered cases. Administered. Very popular topic, Kevin. Diversity in international arbitration. Just, uh, I have a couple of questions, not very tough, but uh, uh, could you please clarify uh, why there is uh, why is there a difference uh, between the statistics published uh, by the SIAC for 2016? You see, for 2016, the information was published about the female arbitrator appointments by uh, SIAC, by the parties, and nominated uh, and by co-arbitrators. Yeah. And for next year's, the statistics have changed, and um, there are um, uh, three new types of uh, statistics emerged. Now it is... Uh, the statistics about the female arbitrators appointed by the SIAC, who are female, just females who are members of the SIAC Court of Arbitration and SIAC Management and Secretariat. So why the part related to the female arbitrators nominated by the parties and nominated by co-arbitrators just has left <laughs> the, the statistics? Yeah. Uh it's, it's really just a different way of presenting figures. What we want to highlight are the elements that are in our control. So what SIC has done very well is really look at appointing our arbitrators with diverse characteristics. And this means more than gender. This is geographic diversity, generational diversity. You want to look at inter intersectionality of diverse characteristics. We cannot control, except for the confirmation process, uh, not, co-arbitrator nominations, party nominations, but the job of institutions really is to function as thought leaders. The more excellent, eminent, uh, diverse arbitrators that we appoint, parties are gonna see these arbitra arbitrators. So say if it's female arbitrators, we're going to appoint an excellent sole arbitrator, female arbitrator that perhaps uh, is not that well known in the market, but we as the institution know that this person is excellent. The next time that law firm, those parties, the other arbitrators are nominating someone, they're probably gonna think of that person. So SIC has been better than almost any institution in terms of prioritizing excellent arbitrators with diverse characteristics. So really just a difference in presenting the data. We wanna show what is in our control and that's the institutional appointments, not uh, confirmations of nominations from the co-arbitrators and the parties. But no doubt uh, the nominations by the parties and the co-arbitrators need to catch up with the institutional appointments because institutional institutions are appointing a lot of diverse candidates but parties and co-arbitrators are catching up slightly slower and um just also speaking about the diversity um do you remember when uh, the siac has joined the pledge as far as i remember they signed it yeah as soon, yeah, as, soon as we signed the pledge as soon as it was issued 
<laughs> yes, 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 of course. Uh, and uh, of course, great news that the number of um, the number of appointments is uh, getting close to to fifty percent. One question in this regard: How uh, what what criteria are taken into account in the process of the um, appointment of arbitrator? Uh, whether it whether the arbitrator should be male or female? Maybe there is there is some I don't know regulation or something like this. Not not really regulation. Not really. The, idea, <laughs> the, the idea and for me and I think even actually during COVID the world has become very small, and what we do at SIC and this is primarily through the leadership of Gary Bourne, the president of the Court of Arbitration, who really uh, values uh, appointing arbitra diverse arbitrators who are the best in the world, is that you appoint arbitrators from everywhere in the world as a secretary. You spend an, an enormous amount of time evaluating talent. You evaluate uh, the performance of counsel in SIC arbitration. So maybe you're looking at a, uh, a young counsel, second second chair, who you think might be good to appoint uh, on a relatively small value case for their first time appointment as an arbitrator. So you're not deciding to appoint arbitrators based on diverse characteristics. You're, you're appointing the best in the world and not letting how things have already been always been done get in your way. So in any case, when you're appointing an arbitrator, you're looking at the Lex Arbitrary, the governing law, the nationalities of the party. You want to appoint uh, a neutral nationality. What is this person's judgment? What is their experience in SIC arbitrations? What is their sector specialty? You're looking at all of this non-exact, non-exhaustive list. And if they also happen to be from a his historically underrepresented group, great. But we don't appoint arbitrators on the basis that they are from a diverse background. What we're doing is making sure that everyone has equal opp opportunity for arbitrary appointments. Yeah, well, I, I think we should hope for the best and uh, just uh, rely on the fact that the statistics in ri is, is rising and um, that we have going to be very even more close to 50% than it is in 2018 and promote, of course, diversity in the yeah. appointments of arbitrators. So I think, I think okay. that, oh, go ahead. No, 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 just continue. I, I, I was just going to say is that what you need is that institutions, institutions that have the vision and the, w and the will, because it can't happen in a few years. And one of the most exciting things about working for an institution is that you can see how arbitrator careers develop. So I can think in my time at SIC, I can remember appointing an arbitrator with diverse characteristics, first appointment. That arbitrator over the last almost decade uh, has been appointed at least 12 times by SIC, by lots of other institutions. So someone that started on a very small value case that now may take a $500 million case, no problem. And this person has really become a leader. What we're doing at SIC is that we're identifying the tal talented individuals and we're giving them an op opportunity. So you have to develop the talent. And so in order for us to get it uh, to where it should be, it is going to take some time, but we're trending in the right direction. Sure, I think that's the, that's the most important part because you have just to, uh, Ensure people and um, kind of uh, encourage them to start this path and uh, go on because uh, if no one starts appointing them, they are not going to be appointed ever. You, you yeah. agree? Absolutely, yeah. So I think I think we're done with the statistics. Uh, says just several follow-up questions, and I think uh, we will close. Um, uh, we will close this session and enjoy enjoy the ribs. Um, Kevin, one question that we're asking um, all uh, individuals coming from arbitration institutions: Could you please give us three key features? of the SEAC making it uh, different from other arbitration institutions? Sure. Uh, I guess structured administration, uh, that's a big thing with, with SIC. So SIC is a bit more like ICC. Within the structured administration, we have the scrutiny of awards. That's probably one of the biggest value adds that SIC does. That's what the SIC Secretariat spends most of its time on is uh, reviewing and approving awards. If you also look at where SIC is in the world, you have a lot of developing jurisdictions, you have enforcement courts with different levels of knowledge, 
So that is uh, a really big feature uh, of SIC. So structured administration uh, scrutiny, a big part of it. The second feature that I think uh, that SIC has that SIC does very well, not to say that other institutions don't do well uh, also, uh, is that we're very innovative. We actually look at users, what do users need? Uh, yes, we can run down the Queen Mary's uh, survey, but what have we actually found uh, from users? So if you look at SIC's history of innovation, emergency arbitration uh, in 2010, expedited procedure in 2010, early dismissal in 2016, we're always trying to look at what can we offer uh, users to make the process uh, a bit more efficient. And the third, and uh, uh, I could probably think of quite a few more than three, and this is something that is challenging to maintain. One of the reasons why SIC got very popular, and I can remember this in 2012, and it's still what I feel every day, is that the staff at SIC, the members of the secretary, these are people that actually love arbitration. And it is a service first institution. What I like to see with SIC, whether it's external counsel or particularly arbitrators, is that SIC is running all the time. So your case counsel is an arbitrator, uh, perhaps I shouldn't be suggesting this, but it is true, is that we are there to assist the arbitrators and the parties. We are not a bureaucracy. So the challenge that we have at SIC, now that we're one of the biggest institutions in the world, is to maintain that same philosophy that we are user first. You can email us and counsel's gonna be getting back to you within 24 hours. Uh, we're gonna push or we're gonna turn things around quickly. We're nimble, uh, unlike say some of the other institutions because our structure is flexible. If, if there was a deadline on the issuance of an award, say it was in the clause that already specified that the award has to be rendered in 90 days, which I have seen in clauses in very high value disputes for some reason at the transaction stage, they've decided that it'll, the final award has to be rendered in 90 days. We have the ability to get that award on day 89, review it, turn it around, get it back to the tribunal. So uh, this third facet, it's, it's service first, user first, but we have to figure out how to maintain that as we get bigger and bigger. If I may, several follow-up questions. Scrutiny, sure. one of the most interesting things in the CIAC activities, of course. When was it introduced in the work of the institution? So the scrutiny yeah, of awards is, yeah, goes, uh, goes back to 2007. So that's where Okay, the okay, very, 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 very old mechanism. And yeah. I noticed that uh, the number of awards uh, issued by the CIAC tribunals in 2019 is... Uh, far more bigger than uh, the number of awards issued in, two, two, in 2018 and uh, earlier because uh, the question maybe uh, the uh, CIAC secretariat started uh, sitting started sitting in the office some additional time because um, <laughs> how, because uh, SIAC issued uh, um, SIAC tribunals issued approximately I think 170 awards uh, last year compared to the statistics of uh, 2018 it was approximately 140 and the only possible conclusion for this is that that the SIAC secretariat is uh, is spending more hours in the office than they than they were spending in 2018. Uh, yeah, they, they, they spent a lot, <laughs> spent a lot of time in the office last year, but it also it's a bit variable as well. You, you could have a case that's bifurcated or trifurcated. You could have a lot of awards, but lots of them are consent awards or summary form awards to the extent that we can decide on the mm -hmm. contours of, of summary form. I think one thing that is interesting as SIC gets higher value in more complex cases, it's not unusual now to get say a five or 600 page award in a big, hotly contested uh, construction or, or project dispute. So all awards uh, are created a bit different. All cases are a bit different. So uh, I don't really think there was an overall difference in the busyness between 2018 and 2019. There happened to be more awards, uh, but these could have also been cases that were commenced the year before. So you could have, it, all, it depends how long the cases are taking to proceed to the final award. The most average case at SIC will take around 12 months. Mm -hmm. from commencement to the issuance of the final award. So sometimes your 2019 figures will be influenced by your 2018 filings. So in 2020, because we had so many cases last year, subject to coronavirus, we would probably expect lots and lots of awards. 
because all of these cases have been commenced sometime in 2019 and are ready to go to award in 2020. Well, um, well, you were um, speaking at Gar Life in Singapore last year. You 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 noticed that uh, uh, you pointed out that the SIAC has an agreement with the with the arbitra arbitration intelligence. Um, how does uh, this, how this tool actually actually work, and how it how does it help just to monitor this conflict of interest issue at the beginning of the process and during the process? The, rela the relationship with arbitrator intelligence, you mean? Yes. Yeah, I mean, I think what you want and all institutions want is that you want uh, a place where user feedback can be incorporated. The problem with getting user feedback always is what is the timing of when this feedback is going to be given? If it's right after the award, the losing party may not be that satisfied with the arbitrator. If it's before the award, uh, parties are probably unwilling to say anything of consequence because they're concerned potentially about the tribunal finding out that there has been this pre-award review. The advantage of, uh, of our relationship with arbitrator intelligence is that it's uh, anonymized and part parties can submit their feedback. We as an institution, we also collate feedback, but you see this across all of the institutions. The institutions are trying to provide users with the platform uh, to uh, judge the performance of arbitrators. I could also circle this back to the scrutiny of awards and why it's important for institutions, say, uh, I mean, primarily ICC and SIC, is that it really does allow you to assess the performance of an arbitrator. Because you have, say, the SIC council is going through all of the pleadings, looking at all of the procedural history, then it goes to me or the registrar. You can really assess the performance of an arbitrator. I think it can be perhaps a little bit difficult at a more light touch institution. So it's, so it's not just the user feedback, it's also the institutional review. We as an institution need to be evaluating the performance of the arbitrators to make sure that we're appointing the best arbitrators in the world. I'm, tr I'm trying to be fast just to not to not not to keep you waiting long for the ribs uh, and um, <laughs> about early dismissal so um, am, I, am I right that um, article 29 uh, for the SIAC arbitration rules of 2016 it uh, originates from the exit arbitration rules yes uh... And the yeah, CIAC I mean, is the first uh, international arbitration center uh, having this provision in the um, resolution of in the, in the arbitration rules for resolution of commercial disputes because you have the separate uh, separate rules for investment arbitration as well. Yeah, yeah, ex exactly right. I mean, it does come from. I mean, Exit has it with uh, forty one sub five, uh, and that's what we looked at, and that's what we tried to update, and we tried to to look at it and figure out how this is going to work in the commercial space. Kevin, there is an issue with your camera, I think. Yes, yes, it's working. Uh, sorry, no going? Uh, yes, 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 I can, I, I can hear you, but, but I can see you, unfortunately. Yes, now, now it's good. Yeah, and, sorry about um, that. Yeah, so, no, so no, no, that's four, fine. 41. 41.5. So what we wanted to look at is how can we take this feature and how can we adapt it to the commercial space. So the first thing we did is we made it early dismissal of, of both claims and defenses. Uh, we took, uh, so for both manifest lack of legal merit and manifestly outside the jurisdiction of the tribunal. So we built off the exit jurisprudence and made it a two-pronged test. We also didn't want to have it time bound. So we call it early dismissal. But it's really not early dismissal because it's not tied, say, to 30 days from the constitution of the tribunal. The way we protected that is by making it a two-stage test. So the tribunal decides whether or not the application for early dismissal is allowed to proceed. I think this has actually been one of the most fun things in commercial arbitration in the last few years because you see effectively a component of ISDS. Uh, you bring it in. Uh, to commercial arbitration to the extent that tribunals didn't have the inherent power to deal with claims at an early stage. But now you're seeing all the institutions are looking at this and you're starting to see council use it. And it was really a slow burn, but now more and more cases where either parties are raising the specter of early dismissal or actually deploying it. And it is, uh, it is resulting in a lot of time and cost savings. 
am I right that there are some similarities between uh, this uh, early dismissal mechanism and uh, um, UK summer judgment and strike out applications? Because the uh, yeah. common lawyers, they have a similar concept in the uh, judicial system, like when you would like to cut unnecessary stuff and the claims of your opponent you can either file an application or ask for summary judgment when where the court will just decide to remove of course there are pleadings positions hearings and so on it's a bit lengthy process but it also happens i'm not i'm not i'm not sure what you think of course for for common lawyers uh summary judgment striking out uh these litigation tools are very familiar but I think that in international arbitration, I'm not sure if there's quite that common law, civil law divide. And we're certainly seeing civil law lawyers using uh, early dismissal as well. Sure, like, sure. I agree that there are yeah. different concepts, international arbitration and litigation. Um, yeah. this, there, there's just no debates about this, just uh, I agree. Yeah. <laughs> And I also noticed that ICC has a similar provision, but they have not included it in, in the rules. They have it in the ICC notes, uh, note to parties, and it is called uh, expeditious determination of manifestly unmerited claims or defenses. Very long yeah. one. <laughs> so I think that, uh, I, I think it's, is it Article 23, I think, of, of the ICC rules? They're just clarifying the Yes, the yes, this of, is just a clarification. Of, of the tribunal. And I think that most commentators and scholars and counsel would suggest that yes, tribunals have the power uh, to deal with these these claims at an early stage, but you also have to, to a certain degree, you have to decide, do you want to have it codified in your rules? You have to think about the eventual enforcement court. So imagine some faraway jurisdiction, a judge that has never heard an arbitration case. Does he want to see it in the rules that the tribunal has this power? Because we were already having tribunals deal with these kind of uh, claims in a, in a summary way at an early stage before we even introduce the provision. But now we see tribunals with a lot more courage because they can point to the rules. And then when it's eventually enforced, you can point to the rules at the, at the enforcement stage. So that was the idea. That's why we wanted to have it codified in the rules. I would, I would like actually to spend some more time on, dis on discussing early dismissal because I'm a big fan of this mechanism actually. But unfortunately, taking into account the limited amount of time and people expecting us, um, expecting to have their ribs. Um, one last question about sanctions. So is there any um, information about uh, SIAC position in relation to Russian sanctions and maybe there are any cases related to Russian related sanctions? Yeah, because, in right, because right now, so, 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 sorry for disturbing, because right now Europe has more tolerance uh, than earlier they did uh, in relation to Russian sanctions, but U.S. are still more conservative, uh, even at the beginning of, of this story. Um, uh, may, may, maybe there is a kind of uh, rough position that exists in SIAC in relation to sanctions. Yeah, yeah I mean, uh, to the extent as a lawyer, you can ever sort of have a rough or broad position. I mean, I think one thing, uh, part of the attraction for Russian parties in Singapore is that Singapore, to a certain degree, is somewhat unburdened by sanction, sanctions for Russian parties. There, of course, was a very good note put out by SEC, ICC, and LCIA on the impact of sanctions in the, uh, in the EU. And, of course, the, generally, uh, the arbitration process, per se, will not be in contravention of sanctions, but you all also want to look at the ultimate beneficiary of every case is an SDN involved, is there a correspondent bank in, involved as well. Usually in arbitration, one of the most difficult things with sanctions is the movement of money. Uh, so generally, because there's not going to be in Singapore and with our banking, there's not going to be a U.S. intermediary bank, uh, the payment is not going to be in USD. So we haven't had uh, problems with Russian parties, and this is part of the reason why I think the Russian parties are choosing uh, Singapore and Hong Kong and Hong Kong is uh, because we don't have the same kind of sanctions. Thank you very much, Kevin. Thank you very much, Kevin, for your patience and for your time. I think that's uh, uh, a very interesting discussion about the SIAC activities. Um, I also wanted just to, uh, to close our discussion by, just let me check it, um, to close our discussion by 
Uh, having a look at the uh, funding campaign that uh, is uh, actively being conducted in the supports uh, of uh, just everyone affected by COVID-19, including uh, medical organizations and, and, and medical staff. Uh, so, if uh, anyone uh, is interested and would like to help, we uh, encourage, of course, uh, everyone to devote some time and money and support um, and support this uh, charity program. So uh, now, now, now we have to say goodbye to Kevin. Thank you very much for participating in our webinars. It was very great to have you here and cooking with us. Um, and. Uh, Yes, everyone enjoyed and they said thank you in the chat. Um, so we wish you a great evening, Kevin, and uh, wish everyone to have uh, a good day in uh, Europe. And thank you for staying with us. Thank you, thank you very much. And, thank and, you for and finally, the last slide devoted to the interview. <laughs> <laughs> Perfectly appropriate. Yes, thank you very much. Have a Thanks, good day. Bye-bye. Have a good day.